but also for those in resistance, uh, they are welcome to ask Matt questions or myself at any time during the presentation or at the end. And from here, I'm gonna have Matt take over. Great, but thanks for the introduction and thanks to everybody for joining us. I uh, would love to make this a conversation, so we're happy to take questions anytime. Don't be shy about interrupting. Uh, so let's start with just the basics. What is an FSA? Uh, FSA stands for flexible spending account. It's one of many forms of tax advantage ways to save or to spend your dollars throughout the year for, for health care and other related expenses. And we'll have a couple of different varieties that we'll talk about today. Now, no, this is, we're not necessarily going to focus today on HSA, which are health savings accounts, so this may sound like the same thing or something very similar. That'll be our next session. We'll dive in there. Uh, secretly, HSAs are my favorite, but there's still a lot of great uses for FSAs, and we'll talk through uh, sort of the pros and cons and the differences between the two. Um, the main difference to really start off is that FSAs are for employees, uh, of a company that offers an FSA. Mm -hmm. And in order to enroll, you need to pair an FSA with a healthcare plan, uh, generally a lower deductible healthcare plan. So, so your standard PPOs and, and other types of plans uh, that you could get through your employer. An HSA must be paired with a high deductible plan uh, through your employer or through the healthcare marketplace. Uh, that's one of the differences just as far as who can use which. So just to double check what you're saying here, someone with an FSA has to be employed with someone that's offering it, whereas someone who wants an HSA, they can do that on their own. That's right. For, for an HSA, you just have to be covered by a high deductible health care plan, whether that's through your employer, through the marketplace, Obamacare, whatever you want to call it. Um, you just have to have that high deductible plan to pair with it. But the FSA is certainly an employer-based plan. And we'll, we'll talk about those differences. I know Brad's going to cover the employer point of view here, but in essence, you can think of an FSA as an employer account. The employer essentially owns and controls that account. You contribute to it out of your paycheck. You're able to use those funds throughout the year, but if there's leftover money, that can go back to the employer. Ooh. The HSA is your own money that you can save out of your paychecks. You can save and invest and spend that money however you want to. And if there's money left at the end of the year, great. It, will, it continues on to next year, the year after, and all the way through your retirement. So uh, it's really, if you think of an FSA as like a cash flow, a way to improve your cash flow, mm -hmm. save some money on taxes, on things that you're going to be paying for anyway. Mm -hmm. Why not make them tax free or tax advantage? And then, uh, but it's definitely to be used and budgeted throughout the year, where the HSA could be more of a long term approach depending on your own financial needs and financial plan. So let's talk about three different types of FSAs. So most people, when they say FSA, what they're talking about is the health, the healthcare FSA or the HCFSA, uh, if you like long abbreviations. The, it, the healthcare flexible spending account, again, pairs with a lower deductible mm -hmm. medical plan through your employer. You can contribute up to $3,200 per year into that account. Uh, if your spouse has a plan where they are also eligible, they can also do 3,200 per year in 2024. So you can get up to $6,400 into these plans. But as we alluded to earlier, and we'll repeat many times throughout this, whatever money is left at the end of the year that you don't spend uh, is returned to the employer. So you wanna make sure that you, you think ahead if you're using a flexible, flexible spending account, there's really three steps as far as I'm concerned. Number one, Try to estimate your expenses throughout the year that are going to be eligible for each type of account. And then you can enroll uh, with that dollar amount. So you take that expense and you divide it by the number of pay periods you have. So that's how, that's how much will come out of each paycheck. And you want to make sure that you're able to review that towards the end of the year, see if there's money left over, and then I'll give you some fun ideas on how to spend leftover money if there's some in there. Could there be a couple websites where you could spend that money? You bet. <laughs> There's also a dependent care flexible spending account. So this one is just like the name would apply to help care for a dependent, whether that's a child under the age of 27, a child of any age if they have a disability or special needs, uh, or other dependents that you're responsible for their care. There's a lot of different ways you can use those funds, but it really has the opportunity to help you make caregiving, which is a substantial expense for a lot of families, 
make that a, a pre-tax or a tax-free expense instead of a, a taxable or after-tax expense. So that can be used for after-school programs, for summer camps, for adult daycare, for lots of different options. I know when my children were younger, we used a dependent, flex, a dependent care flexible spending account for uh, for daycare expenses. So we had one that was doing an after-school program in Des Moines called uh, Metro Kids mm -hmm. uh, at the school. So we would use that for, for him. We would use the, the same account for other kids for their actual daycare and preschool before they, they started school. So it's uh, you really have to know how much you're going to spend on those expenses and, and try to, to match that up with how much you contribute. The dependent care flexible spending account does have a different contribution limit. Uh, that is five thousand um, dollars for a family, or twenty five hundred dollars if you file uh, individually as if not jointly uh, per year. Uh, so you can use up to that amount in pre tax expenses. Anything above and beyond that is is obviously just going to be out of pocket. The third type that we're going to talk about today, the Lex HCFSA or the Limited Expense Healthcare Flexible Spending Account, is it's sort of a more limited version of number one on this list. So it's a, if it's, it's still a healthcare flexible spending account, but it can really only be used for things like vision and dental that may not be covered uh, under other types of plans. So then to summarize what you're saying is, is that people who have uh, young children or uh, dependent adults inside their home really need to ask their employer about whether or not there's a dependent care FSA available. Because uh, many employers don't even know that there's a there's more than one type of FSA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think big picture, who could use an FSA? Well, it's anybody who has children, uh, anyone who has other dependents, anyone who goes to the doctor or the dentist or wears glasses. So if you are a person who goes to the doctor or the dentist, wears glasses, or has kids or is caring for somebody else, there's going to be one, of, one or more of these accounts that might be a good fit for you if your employer offers it. So definitely, we always encourage people to make the most of what you have available through your employer. So if, you, if you're if you the employee and you haven't enrolled in one of these plans before, ask what's available, look at it for annual enrollment time, and, and start to give some thought to how you can, again, take things that you're gonna pay for anyway and make it a little bit easier to pay for because most of these accounts will have a debit card. So you can just pay for your eligible expenses directly out of these accounts. Uh, and there's some other benefits that make them very easy for folks to cash flow, make these expenses come out of your paycheck and be easier for you to pay for instead of having to come up with those big bills all the time. And then again, it makes it also pre-tax or tax-free uh, depending on how you look at that. It seems like I'm losing another excuse to when my doctor tells me to get something done or do something medically, I, I'm losing another excuse there if I have the money in the FSA. And that's really what we want people to do is to go to the doctor when they yeah. have the need. And these are ways for people to help save them. Yeah, with rising healthcare costs and rising deductibles and, and more people that are uninsured or that, are, that have had uh, a lot of out-of-pocket expenses, uh, this is one of those ways where you can put money aside specifically for these purposes uh, again, save some money on taxes and, and just make sure that you're not having to choose between do I pay the mortgage this month or do I pay the health care bills uh, that are coming in. Uh, obviously, we want you to go to the doctor and the dentist and, and get glasses when you need them. Uh, so these are great ways to make sure that you feel comfortable doing that. You budgeted for it. It's bucketed. It's, it's right there for you and it's easy to access. So how do you know which one of these to choose? Well, again, the health care FSA is where employees and dependents can use, use for medical expenses. This, like I said before, does pair with those lower deductible health care plans only through your employer. Uh, dependent care, uh, you have lots of different options on how you can use those. Uh, but to use a, a dependent care FSA, you have to have uh, expenses related to, again, a child under age 27, uh, a child that has a, a disability or special needs, so throughout their lifetime, even after age 27, um, or someone else that, you, that has filed under taxes that has limited income of their own. Um, we already kind of went through what each of these three things are for, uh, but sort of the way you use them together is interesting too, I think, because if you have a healthcare FSA, you could also have a dependent care FSA. Mm -hmm. So you could put some money aside to pay your health care expenses and put a separate bucket aside to pay for your child care expenses or your adult daycare expenses or caregiving expenses that you may have. 
Uh, the limited expense health care, again, is really just earmarked for those uh, additional expenses like vision and dental uh, that are not necessarily covered by other types of plans. So this one you might pair with an HSA, uh, for example, where you can use this specifically for those items, uh, the HSA for other types of expenses. Uh, so really the, the type of account depends on what your expenses are, how much are they gonna be, which categories are you spending, and obviously what your employer offers. Sure, and so for families that need a dependent care FSA, do they need to fill out any other special paperwork certifying that someone is a babysitter or this is an official after school program? Uh, elder care doesn't have to be with, um, let's say, PACE uh, or any other specialized program, or can it be with any uh, type of? My understanding is that they're very flexible on that, and with which, in your experience, would you? So, with this, I've seen that as long as they're able to demonstrate to the plan administrator. So plan administrator is someone who's in charge of the big chest of money at the company that has all the funds of the FSA. And based upon their, not only their definitions of the plan, you have to always check your plan, of course, but there's also the wording uh, within tax code. And so with these, uh, they can be very broad. And for the most part, they wanna keep them broad. Uh, there is no problem with uh, sending your child to a religious school after, um, sorry, after school program uh, and have that also covered by dependent care. Great. Typically, your employer will ask you to provide some, or your plan administrator will ask you to provide the tax ID number for who for the organization that's caring for your kid. That, that way, they know that it's a legitimate um, thing, and that that organization is is also claiming that income on their taxes. So little things, yeah. <laughs> little things to keep track of. Um, so who's eligible? We covered a little of this already, but to use an FSA. Again, this is for W-2 employees only. Uh, the employer has to offer a health care plan that is not a high deductible health care plan. Uh, and the employer has to elect the FSA option for their employees to have access to it. Uh, so this is, again, not something that you can go out and set up on your own, something you have to use through your employer. Or if you're the employer, uh, then that's something that you should consider for your employees to give them some options and some benefits uh, that I think uh, could be really valuable for families. So this is a pretty common question that's coming up next is about what happens as you get a little bit older. Uh, you, you may have heard that there are some types of accounts, once you're on Medicare, you cannot, you cannot any longer participate in uh, some types of plans. So an HSA, for example, when you're Medicaid eligible, or Medi so Medicare eligible, excuse me, that you can uh, you have to stop contributing to your HSA if you are on Medicare. Now, you can keep your HSA and spend that money on lots of different things, uh, but you can't contribute to it any longer. In contrast, for FSAs, uh, you still have to enroll. So a lot of people working past age 65, this has been another recent trend as people working later in life. When you turn age 65, you're going to get Medicare. You're going to get Medicare Part A, which is the part that is... Uh, generally free to most people. Uh, I shouldn't say free because you're paying for it out of your payroll taxes, but it's at least not an additional premium. Getting it's some of that bag. You get some of that back. And then Medicaid, Medicare Part B is the type that does have a monthly premium, an annual premium that you'll have to pay. And so if you have an employer uh, that offers a health care plan and you're still employed, you can put off Part B you might as well take part A because it's not any additional charge in most cases. A lot of people put off part B until later. Uh, but again, as long as you're employed and as long as you're part of the company's retirement plan, even if you have other types of coverage, you can still contribute to your FSA and you can still use the money that was in your FSA uh, with a couple of exceptions. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Sure. I just want to remind people that the uh, the state itself, the state of Iowa, and every state has to have what's called SHIP and SMP. SMP is a uh, Senior Medicare Patrol, and uh, SHIP, together with SMP, helps advise uh, seniors as to what plan each year that they can pick for um, Medicare Advantage as well as Part B. And so it's important to contact your state's insurance division if they haven't already contacted you because they want you to have the best plan possible that caters specifically to your needs, but also to avoid elder fraud. 
to Tim. Medicare can be very confusing for a lot of folks. And Enormously confusing. Yes. All right. So the fun part here, I think, is once you've funded your FSA, so you've enrolled through your employer and you've got a pot of money there for you to use throughout the year, what can you spend that on? Well, obviously you can use it for co-pays that you pay at the doctor, uh, deductibles, if you have a deductible on your plan, however you're paying out-of-pocket healthcare expenses. You can use it for prescription drugs. You can use it for just about anything that is medical or medical adjacent, uh, I would say, except for paying health insurance premiums. This is another difference between FSAs and HSAs that we'll talk about later, is that uh, you cannot pay health insurance premiums through your FSA, but you could through an HSA uh, if you're if you're eligible and you use an HSA instead. So so far we've heard the words deductible, premium, copay. These can get very confusing for people. Do you mind just uh, mentioning just a couple of words describing uh, copay, deductible, and premium differences? Sure. So any healthcare plan is going to ask you to pay some portion of their medical costs. They do this for a number of different reasons. One, just to share the cost with you. The other, to maybe encourage you to, to think twice before any mm -hmm. unnecessary medical expenses. So if, if everything was completely paid for by the insurance company, someone might feel like they could, they should go to the doctor maybe more than what they need to. Uh, I think this is sort of the philosophy of that. So they share that cost with you two ways. It's either through a copay, so your plan may say, every time you go to the doctor, it's $25 or $50 or whatever the, the, the amount that they specify within that plan. And that's usually on the card people have. It'll be on the card, it'll be on your plan documents or on the website that where you enroll. Uh, so when you go to the doctor, the doctor will collect that generally right then and there, mm -hmm. the, the healthcare professional, whatever it is. Uh, they may vary depending on the type of service. If it's a specialist, it may be more. If it's the primary care physician, it may be a little less. There may be some things that have no copay, which are things generally like preventative, annual physicals, and things like that. So that's a that's a copay. A deductible is uh, essentially they don't set a fixed dollar amount for the copay. They set a fixed dollar amount for the year. So if you're paying a, a copay fifty dollars every time you go in, your deductible may be five thousand dollars or three thousand dollars for the year, and you pay the first three or five thousand dollars, and then and then the healthcare plan kicks in after that. So that is a, a really a difference in the way these plans are constructed. I mentioned deductibles have been going up. That means they're asking you to pay more uh, every year, but it's not per visit; it's per year, and every. Every time you get a bill, whatever you pay there out of pocket goes towards that deductible. And once you hit that number, then your costs can go down from there. Okay. So then the premiums are what my uh, what my employer takes out every month yep. to pay towards health insurance. And I can choose to add into my FSA if I want, but it's not mandatory. That's, That's right. right. Yeah, premiums are the sort of the insurance expense that is usually shared between the employer and the employee. Um, but that is what you see coming out of your paycheck every month. The lower the deductible, the lower the copays, the higher the premiums are, uh, and vice versa uh, should also be true. So when you're looking at which plan do I choose through my employer or which plan do I choose through the marketplace, those are the decisions the trade offs should have to make. Is it worth it to me to pay more every month out of my paycheck mm -hmm. uh, in order to have lower copays? Or maybe I don't use a lot of healthcare uh, you know, resources and I don't go to the doctor very often. So maybe I would say I'm going to pay less in premiums and have a higher deductible or copay, betting that I won't, you know, get as sick or or have as many injuries and, and need to use that money. So um, we talked about the fact that you have to spend this money throughout the year. If you don't, at the end of the year, that money is forfeited. Uh, that is an unfortunate uh, situation. In fact, about forty percent of FSA users leave some money on the table at the end of the year. So that means employers are. Paying, sorry, employees are paying their employers. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it, you can think of it that way. Um, the employer has a couple options on how they use whatever forfeited money is, is left over at the end of the year. But this is why, again, it's important to plan ahead. Let's look at how much you typically spend on healthcare, how much you think you're going to spend on on daycare and other expenses, and let's make sure we fund the flex spending account with the right amount so that it that's used up throughout the year. But if you get to the end of the year and you say, well, there's still some money left over, uh, what can I do with that? And maybe thinking outside the box a little bit, you mentioned a couple of websites. Uh, you can just Google FSA and it'll give you some sites. Uh, I also like Amazon's website. Uh, I know some people are 
you know, depending on your opinion of, of Amazon, sure. if you like using them or not, but you can, on Amazon's website, they have a whole page of FSA eligible expenses. Mm -hmm. And if you look through what some of those things are, you might be surprised to find out that you can use it. Again, co-pays, prescriptions, you can always use it for over-the-counter medications. Mm -hmm. So cold and flu season is coming up. You, you can stock up on, on Mucinex and, and Theraflu or whatever you use there. You can use it for tissues and hand sanitizer. You can use it for uh, thermometers and, and pregnancy tests, um, fertility treatments, birth control, contraceptives, uh, baby monitors. Uh, uh, if you didn't use it for birth control and contraceptives, <laughs> uh, sunscreen, thermometers, uh, again, uh, nursing expenses, uh, skincare products. Uh, you can use it for sleep related products like melatonin and, and masks, sleeping masks. I was just going to ask CPAPs, a lot of CPAP machines, machines. But yes. uh, a heated blanket, even, or a humidifier for your bedroom that makes it easier for you to sleep. That's going to be a positive thing for your health and it's an FSA eligible expense. Even if you have to travel a long way to go to your doctor, mm -hmm. um, you, can, you can get mileage uh, reimbursed out of your FSA. Uh, you can use it for acupuncture, for chiropractor visits, for uh, other alternative treatments, uh, prescription glasses or sunglasses, um, antibacterial ointments, first aid kits. So, you know, those things that, that come up, especially if you have kids, you know, there's, there's always a need for band-aids and antibacterial ointment, uh, dental procedures, Invisalign, things that might be covered by your insurance. Um, but interestingly, not toothbrush or toothpaste. Um, <laughs> Although there are electric toothbrushes that are available uh, on the FSA sites. So not the day-to-day the -day stuff, but more of the investing in your, in your teeth. Um, nicotine patches and gum, uh, if you want to stop smoking. Tums, uh, allergy medicine, uh, shoe inserts um, are all eligible expenses. Any kind of medical equipment, diagnostic equipment, blood uh, pressure uh, sleeves or, or pulse monitor, I mean, blood oxygen monitors, diabetic testing supplies, all of that stuff. Uh, mobility aids. I mean, we, it goes on and on. One of that I found really interesting. You can use it for ancestry DNA or uh, 23andMe DNA testing if you if you invest in the health reports that come out of that. So if it's supporting, if you're learning about your own DNA or, or family history in support of your health uh, related goals, you can do DNA testing from your. Uh, from your FSA account. That is the most creative use of an FSA. I thought you were going to say foot massager or something like that. I would imagine you could do that as well. So yeah, lots, lots of options. We could go on all day with, with how to spend those monies. But it is just important, again, think through your expenses every year. Think about what you could use it on. And then, yeah, if you have money left, or, uh, if you have money left at the end of the year, go shopping or have some, uh, get some extra massage or, or chiropractic visits in to help use up those dollars and, and help your health uh, coming into the new year. All right, so we'll talk a little bit about taxes. There was a, a cartoon I like that there's, it shows two, uh, two um, like booths for information. And one of them is the meaning of life. And there's no line at uh, that one. And one is tax avoidance, and there's a line out the door, right? So <laughs> then we're always looking for ways to, to, to pay Uncle Sam less uh, in, in the state, of course, as well. Uh, so I think what we want to emphasize here is there are tax benefits for using the FSA. Mm -hmm. uh, you're essentially taking that money out of your paycheck before taxes, before your income taxes, before your FICA taxes. So the, the money that you were going to spend anyway is now going to reduce the amount of taxes that you owe for that year. Um, but they don't allow you to double dip. So uh, as Brad noted in here, the government wants to incentivize healthcare spending, but not go broke. Uh, so they're not going to let you both take pre-tax money out of your paychecks and reduce the income tax you owe, and take those same expenses and claim a tax deduction on those expenses. Uh, you're really going to have to choose one or the other. Now, they do work together. There are some tax deductions that you could still take, or uh, child-dependent tax care credit, for example, that you could still take even if you use your dependent care account if you have enough expenses to cover both. Mm -hmm. So if you're, for example, if you're using your child and dependent care account for $2,500 per year, uh, but you have $10,000 in daycare expenses, which is not unusual for, for parents with small children, uh, you can have $2,500 as tax-free, and then $7,500 that could go towards your deductions 
uh, for that dependent care expense, which you wouldn't get the full amount, but you would have, uh, it would give you the option to, to take advantage of both of those. You just can't double dip on the same dollar. So when my accountant asks for receipts and lists of expenditures, they don't want anything necessarily that came out of my FSA because that would be deductible. That's right. Okay. Yeah, anything, anything that is already accounted for from your FSA or already reimbursed from an FSA or an HSA is now no longer a deductible expense. And, and again, that makes logical sense that if it's tax-free already, you can't then go ahead and re-deduct that from your taxes. Now, there are some deadlines to pay attention to uh, as well. Uh, it is important to uh, enroll during automatic enrollment time or your annual enrollment time period. Um, use those dollars by 1231, but there is maybe, depending on your employer, there is maybe a little bit of wiggle room with that. Uh, generally, up to two and a half months into the new year, you might be able to spend previous year's expenses. So if you have some bills come and due right at the end of December, uh, you still have some time to pay those from your FSA. Uh, and some plans allow a carryover. So we say you use it, you lose it, uh, but there's a little bit of wiggle room with that as well. So up to $640 per year, if your employer allows it, could stay in your FSA from one year to the next. You just have to check your employer's plan to see if that's eligible or available to you. And, and so that's a really important point that everyone who has who is FSA eligible, that means they are a W-2 employee who has an employer that offers an FSA plan, they have to talk to HR. You have to speak to human resources and find out the specifics of your plan. Because if you don't, you might think you have the same obligations or uh, wiggle room, as we call it, as a, a neighbor or a friend at a different employer. Mm -hmm. But really, they're under a completely different plan. They have different rules. They may not apply to you at all. That's right. Uh, in, in both of our professions, I think the, we, we often face challenges from people who heard something from somebody else uh, yeah. and, and wants to do the same thing uh, because there's a lot of good information out there that may be completely inapplicable to your situation. Uh, so it's good to make sure that you're talking to your professionals looking at your plan and making sure that, that you're you're really focused on what's uh, what your situation is and how it fits into your finances. Oh, sure. And, and it's uh, even though we encourage everyone, of course, to do their own research, uh, it is important to understand that Google does not have the answers that your human resources professional will have in your office. So we really want to stress uh, that the Internet is for general ideas, but you have to talk to professionals before you make any financial uh, decisions that can impact your life. Absolutely. Well, we've talked a lot about the employee perspective. So for those of you who are employees of a company that offers an FSA, uh, hopefully you have some, some good ideas on how to use your plan. Uh, but this is also important for employers to understand why it would make sense to offer an FSA and what do they need to watch out for uh, from the employer perspective. And uh, just from experience, March 1, when people do have the two and a half month uh, buffer, uh, that's when we uh, sometimes call it the race. People will try and bring in receipts and scribble notes on them and submit it to an FSA. There's no reason to do that. If you, of course, if you're all perfect and be able to submit them on time, if you're able to submit them in a batch, many FSA providers and third party administrators really prefer getting things in um, batches if you're going to do it, just because it's a little bit easier to go through. Um, if you're going to wait for the two and a half month period, just remember you're waiting longer to be reimbursed. And there's no reason to not get your money back sooner. So you have that time, but you really want to get your money back sooner than later. And uh, so we are going to move on. Thank you so much, Ned, by the way. That was fantastic information. I'm so glad we have you here. Uh, so what are my employer's obligations in terms of health insurance and FSAs? So according to the Affordable Care Act, only employers with 50 or more employees must provide health insurance to at least 95% of their eligible staff. So I hear a lot of numbers there. If you see more than 50 people at your employer uh, working with you, then you likely have an employer that has to have a plan. So employers do not need to offer an FSA. That's a benefit and a perk that we want to talk about more because it does help people want to apply to your business and also stay with the employer. 
If the employer does not offer an FSA, then you cannot open an FSA. But you can open your mail and you can ask human uh, resources and you can ask your boss and you can talk to them and ask them if this is something we could add to next year's. Absolutely. I think from the employer perspective, there's a huge cost related to acquiring new employees. And it's much less expensive to keep good employees that you already have uh, than it is to replace. I think the, the last number I saw for a, a worker that makes, say, $75,000, it would cost potentially up to $300,000 to find, replace, and train a new uh, replacement for that person. So as an employer, the benefits package is one of the main reasons that people stay, is one of the main reasons people rejoin your employer. Uh, and so it's, it's really in your benefit to, to offer uh, things like FSAs uh, in order to make sure that, that you're competitive and that you can keep good people. And it costs so much to find employees because you're not just considering putting out an ad, it's all the hourly wages of the people that interviews look over all of those resumes. So this is really a boon for uh, employers to keep the money that they already have, keep their employees that they have. And not to mention the lost knowledge and productivity and you know uh, experiences that you could lose if you're not retaining the best workforce, the most diverse workforce that you can. And we know that a lot of folks do have significant expenses and stress related to medical costs and caregiving, and those are reasons that they may have to leave the workforce if there's not a good solution in place. Oh, definitely. And in this very tight uh, environment in the market to find good employees, having these benefits that uh, are very, I don't want to say very simple to set up, but it, it's all, you can contact a professional and you, the busy employer, can talk to someone like you and set it up for the entire company in just a couple of uh, days, two weeks, really, have it in uh, into the hands of the employees. So this is not something that's a barrier that's too difficult to overcome for an employer. Uh, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit more now. Why are employers in the health insurance business anyway? So uh, I like to say I'm one of the first attorneys who for some reason enjoys ERISA and everyone's saying, what is this horrible, horrible acronym? Um, so in 1974, um, Richard Nixon, who is not a crook, signed a bipartisan piece of legislation known as ERISA. So it stands for the Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974. Its main purpose was to create uniformity across the country. It's a national standard. It's for self-funded health insurance plans, retirement benefits, pension plans, and other related products such as securities. The reason it encompasses so much is because it was difficult for employers on one side of the country to necessarily entice employees in a pool in the entire country to move towards them because maybe if then uh, uh, there just wasn't enough uh, government uh, oversight in one state, another state had a different policy, one state might not cover uh, some other issues. And so creating uniformity allowed people to travel across the country more and keep their insurance that they had, more or less. So the statute encouraged national uniformity by providing employers tax deductions and other incentives to offer health insurance to their employees. So this statute also expanded employer adoption of self-funded health insurance plans. And so we're going to learn a little bit more about all of that. So what is a self-funded plan? I mean, if I'm paying it, isn't it self-funded no matter what? I, it, it gets a little confusing, but not every plan is self-funded. In this country now, most plans are um, ERISA covered. So self-funded plans are those cafeteria plans. Uh, we also sometimes interchange them with health insurance. The idea of a cafeteria plan, or the word using cafeteria means that you can go up and pick certain things off of the menu, off the list, what's on the board that day. And so you can pick and choose and customize, like Matt said, for the necessities of your family. So this is an important distinction from your plan, from your plan that are not self-funded. Self-funded plans are regulated by the federal government. That's the Department of Labor. Non-self-funded plans are regulated by the state government. In this state, it's the Iowa Department of Insurance and Financial Services. 
So self-funded here would be an insurance plan that is only in Iowa, that is not touched by, uh, let's say, interstate travel is the best way to put it. Um, it um, for different reasons, we want to say that the employer, as well as the employees, everything, including the insurance policy, all are within one state. And that one place kind of makes it a non-self-funded plan. But you can defer and assume that if you have a health insurance plan and you have an FSA or HSA, you likely are in a self-funded plan that is overseen by ERISA. So in the future, we're going to be talking about ERISA and its impact uh, a little bit more in, the, uh, in later slides. I'm sorry, later presentations. So it is a very complicated issue. And we all need to learn a little bit more about it because our rights are dependent upon it. They could be limited or expanded by understanding a statute. The state of Iowa now, even though we did say ERISA is national, everyone has to follow the same rules. The state of Iowa can pass new laws and make new requirements to self-funded health insurance plans to a certain degree. The Iowa Insurance Division then writes regulations based on those codes and enforces Iowa insurance law. Now, the vast majority, like I said, of Americans are under self-funded plans, and it's important to educate yourself. Uh, it is very hard and difficult to enforce your rights under self-funded plans unless you understand your rights a little bit more. If you have your insurance through your municipal account or state government, the Department of Labor does not regulate your plan, even if it is self-funded. And so that's very important in states that are more rural, like Iowa, where counties, uh, small towns, employ a large percentage of the population there. So if you cannot resolve your issue, I highly, highly recommend people contact the Iowa Insurance Division. We do have a um, consumer advocate, and they will absolutely help you through it. Of course, I'm not speaking on behalf of the Iowa Insurance Division. I just want to say that. Uh, moving on, we want to talk about why employers are really involved in the health insurance industry. So there are two main types of private health insurance, uh, health insurance plans. There's one that's low deductible and high deductible. So Matt told us about what the word deductible meant. It, it kind of describes the maximum amount out of pocket that you'll be paying for the year. So there's really, there's only two options for private entities to look at, private employers. So besides Medicare and Medicaid, which is, they're very large programs, of course, and they cover large percentages of the, of the country. Those that are still working, typically low deductible plans are cheaper for employees because the employer is subsidizing a larger portion of the plan. And if self-funded, accepting a large amount of risk because the more you have to pay, what happens if profit goes down? You still have to pay into the fund, into the plan that you chose as the employer. High deductible plans lead more of the risk with the individual and therefore cost less for the employer to sponsor generally. So these plans, it's important to try and see and understand whether or not you do have a low deductible or high deductible. And so there are benefits to employers to have these plans. And so a lot of employers just think that every expense is an expense that a dollar that's not going into their pocket. And in this case, they are not correct. Um, employers do not have to contribute to any employee's FSA. They are allowed to offer it. Yet employers who simply offer an FSA do tend to get higher employee retention rates as we've discussed before. They benefit from providing access to an FSA in a second one a reduction in how much they pay in matching payroll taxes. Mm -hmm. So I'm a little bit confused here for a second. So my employer is going to also pay my taxes for payroll. And so can you uh, just talk briefly about that, if you can, about why does my employer also have to pay a matching payroll tax? Or, or rather, explain how that works. Yeah, so if you, if you look at your pay stub as an employee, 
you'll see a lot of line items in the tax section. There's some federal tax, some state tax, there's some FICA tax. Mm -hmm. And FICA is the one really that we're talking about here along with the federal uh, unemployment tax. These are two types of taxes that are shared between employers and employees. So it's really the cost of, of having an employee and, and ensuring that employee and for that employee that be part of the Medicare and Social Security system. So those taxes, they're split evenly between employer and employee. And you know, the people who know that best are those that are self-employed because you end up paying both sides of that. Mm -hmm. um, but the for as an employee, you might see employer paid taxes and employee paid taxes on separate line items, and you'll see uh, FICA taxes uh, are in both categories. Mm -hmm. and, and so yeah, it is a benefit to the employer to try to find ways to reduce their taxes that they pay on behalf of their employee. And employers are usually happy to hear that they have to pay Uncle Sam a little bit less each year. And so employer contributions to an FSA, though, are not deductible to the employer. And we'll get more into that. The parts that can get a little bit confusing for employers and for the general public is understanding what is what are all of those letters? The acronym SALAD, there's FICA, UTA, FSAs. My gosh, it can go on forever, it seems like. All of those acronyms. So FSAs typically have a use, I'm sorry, have a use it or lose it sort of component to it, as Matt has mentioned in the past. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, earlier. And that's based on a calendar year. So we might have heard of fiscal year before versus calendar year. Calendar year means January 1, fiscal year, can mean any time in theory that a company decides that their accounting is best done. So we're going to give an example here. Um, the employer's plan documents will outline how much, if anything, can be rolled over. For most of the limits, around $640, that's a very generous rollover. Um, it seems to be a magic number for um, many uh, states as well. It costs the employer about $60 a year to pay a third-party administrator just to process FSA claims. And that's per employee. The average employee contributes about $1,350 to an FSA yearly. And at this point, I just want to thank a wonderful clerk that has been uh, helping us here at the Harvard Institute. Uh, Rachel, thank you very much for helping us get all of these specifics and all of these citations in there. So if we take the $1,350 of the yearly FSA contribution by employee and multiply it by 7.65%, and that equals to $103 in tax savings for each, the employee and the employer. And so right there, we're looking at a savings of $43 per year per employee for the employer. So just by having this and signing up, you're going to get money back as the employer without doing much more than a couple of e-signatures or docu-signs, it sounds like. So if the employee has a dependent FSA, perhaps for their children, and they pay in the maximum contribution of 3200 the employer benefits even more so. So $3,200 times what FICA's value is, I'm sorry, at 7.65%, is about $245 in tax savings for both the employer and the employee, and the employer automatically reduced their cost an additional $185. So encouraging your employees is the best thing you can do to save more money as the employees contribute more and more into their FSAs. Also, as I said earlier, wait a second, am I paying my employer? Unfortunately, sometimes at the end of the year, if you don't spend it, you lose it, and that is automatically rolled over to part of the revenue of the employer, with some exceptions, of course, looking at the plan documents. So employers probably won't hate that part either. Nope. If there's a if there's a risk to be had there, and that risk may lead them to have a little extra revenue at the end of the year is probably not the end of the world. Uh, from the employee perspective, so you're saving the 7.65% of FICA taxes, but you're also saving your federal and state income taxes on those dollars as well. So the saving for the employee is even bigger than what you showed there, uh, but what you showed is that the employer is also saving a substantial amount for each employee. So you've got tax savings on, on both levels. So there's a considerable amount of money out there that people aren't getting back from the government that they can use. Um, if we 
try and answer the question, how does providing just the option of an FSA reduce an employer's tax burden? There's some more uh, intricacies to that. And so we're going to give some more concrete numbers in that slide. How does providing just the option of an FSA reduce an employer's tax burden? In general, your employer matches your FICA and your uh, social security. I'm sorry, FICA covers your social security and Medicare tax. And so with that, if you also have FUTA, which is an unemployment tax. So if we look at, I believe it's slide 19. I apologize. One of the great benefits of being able to uh, speak here at Harkin is that those of us with disabilities can really demonstrate that we have them. For me, I am visually impaired, so I'm going to put on my glasses one more time and make sure I uh, can read the slide a little bit better. In general, your employer matches your FICA, which is your Social Security and the cost of Medicare, with your FUTA, which is an unemployment tax. FICA is 7.65% up to the first $168,800. So Matt, what happens when we hit that magic number? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a reason these programs have uh, largely been thought of as regressive, right? So you're, you're paying in to Social Security and Medicare uh, up to your first 168,800 in income. After that, you're not paying in on those additional dollars. So as of today, those those are all subject to change with the whims of Congress, of course. Um, but there's there is for some very high income taxpayers, they're paying in less into Social Security and Medicare. Now, the amount they get back out of Social Security represents a smaller portion of their income. So there's there's some you know thoughts, schools of thought on fairness there, but but yeah, you you're only paying on the first hundred and sixty-eight thousand eight hundred in income. So if you're making more than that, uh, the tax rate sort of drops off there. And that's one of the great benefits of coming to these lectures and these series is that you start to see these links between your own um, between the topic we present, your own life, and also these bigger issues. Talking about what should Congress do necessarily. We don't have the answers, oh, gosh, I wish we did, but knowing more can help you as a voter as well. So FUTA is 0.6% up to the first $7,000. Technically it's higher, but everyone almost always gets uh, the first, I believe 5.4% back uh, automatically. Any pre-tax funds paid into an FSA become tax excluded for both the employee and the employee or Tax excluded means that it is not taxable. We want that because money that isn't taxed, you get to keep. Taxes are assessed generally based on taxable income. Money based uh, inside of an FSA is excluded from the calculation of taxable income. That reduces the gross taxable income for the employee. Employers pay their portion of FICA and FUTA based on the total all the employees that they have and all of their gross income. So a reduction in all of that gross income that's taxable will reduce how much the employer has to match when contributing to FICA and FUTA. So if employees all maxed out their FSAs, their employer is going to be very happy, it sounds like, because they're gonna be able to have extra revenue, profit, and also maybe bonuses for employees, other incentives to keep better people, uh, as well as the people that they have working for them as well. So, when we look at the tax treatment of FSA contributions for employees, we want to talk about pre-tax dollars. Now, this is a distinction for some people that is a little bit tricky when we say pre-tax, post-tax. If you haven't paid tax on something yet, it's pre-tax, and you can look at it that way. So any income you earn is considered pre-tax before you pay Uncle Sam. The federal government taxes us on all of our income, with very few exceptions. Um, the tax code in this country just happens to be several hundred thousand pages long. And so um, within there, you'll find several exceptions. One of those exceptions is money placed into an FSA or HSA. This means that you will not pay income on the portion of your income that you place in an FSA. So with this example, 
if you make $50,000 in one year as an employee, that places you into the 22% tax bracket. That's federal tax, excuse me. And you contribute the $1,350 to your FSA, which those were pre-tax dollars, you would pay $297 less in federal income taxes because that's $1,350 times the 22% of taxes you would have paid. Now, like you said, we have the matching funds, FICA, FUTA, and with those savings, that's an extra $103, $81. And when you add that all up, you're looking at a savings of that $481. Now, that amount of money is saved by the employer and the employee. But as the employee, your perspective now is that your, 15, your $1,350 that you put in there is actually worth $1,831 in that case that you could spend on all types of medical expenses. We're not saying those savings you have have to be put towards medical expenses. We're just saying now that you have the capacity to use these tax preferred plans to spend more money on your own health. And that's very important these days as uh, medical expenses continue to rise. And so, Matt, can you uh, help us summarize and take everything home for us? Sure. I mean, I think the, the perspective, as we talked about for HSA or for FSAs, are important for both employees and for employers. So if you're an employee of a company that offers or may offer a health care plan, uh, check to see if your FSA is available. That's mm -hmm. step one. Uh, if there is one available or, or all three types available, uh, start thinking about what expenses you may have and how much you spend each year in each of these categories for health care, for dependent care, uh, for vision, for dental. How much are you paying out of pocket today? If you're going to pay that money anyway, might as well make it free tax or, or tax free, uh, depending on how you look at it. Again, we'll always recommend you talk to your financial professional, your tax professionals, your employers to make sure you understand what's available, how it affects you personally. On the employer side, if you're not offering FSA today, uh, if you have a, a health care plan, uh, or, or, but you don't have an FSA, you might want to think about the tax savings just for putting it on the table mm -hmm. uh, and the additional tax savings when employees contribute more and more to that plan. So you want to not only offer one, but encourage participation and higher participation and higher deferrals into those uh, because it's going to save both you and your employees money on taxes. This can also, again, lead to better employee satisfaction, more productivity. Uh, we know from research that people, when they're stressed about money, when they're stressed about uh, caregiving or healthcare expenses, uh, it affects their work. It affects their uh, satisfaction with their job and their day to day. Uh, you may lose employees from the workforce entirely if they don't have the support they need or they don't have the cash flow they need to cover some of these expenses. So it's so important uh, to offer benefits like this, help your employees make the most of them, in order to attract, retain, and support uh, the best quality people that you want working for you. So that's that's the employer perspective. So really, this is a great way to reduce possibly sick days here. Because right. people are healthier, they're going to be in the chair working and helping you make money as the employer as well. And, and that's an important thing to consider is that healthier employees can work more. And so that means more revenue for everyone. That might sound a little bit cold, but we have to encourage more employers within our community to provide options for every member that lives here within the state of Iowa and across the country as well. And you've alluded to the fact that this is the first of many um, series. So thank you for being here. Uh, tell us about what's coming next. So uh, Matt is not only an expert in financial planning and FSAs, but in particular, this, one of his great specialties are HSAs. And we're also going to touch on MSAs, uh, HRAs. There is an entire menagerie of acronyms that we'll be talking about. Uh, Matt's wonderful focus on uh, special needs families has its, he's one of the greatest experts because you have to learn so much in this particular field. So coming up, we're going to be talking about HSA and several other programs. And I want to have a special thank you to Matt for being here. Thank you so much. And of course, uh, thank you all for being here. And if anyone has a question, of course, please uh, enter it into the chat or you're welcome to uh, ask it in person. Uh, with that, we hope you come to the uh, next presentation that we have. And so if there are any questions out there, Okay, well, 
Uh, there are not uh, questions today, but next time I guarantee because so many people have HSAs and people who have HSAs, 93% of them do typically contribute and enroll. So we will have a lot of information from that next time in, the, in our series. So thank you everyone for joining us here at the Harkin Institute. We are uh, determined to not only make the community more engaged with what we do here, but also healthier as well. And so that's why we're having this series. Excellent. I'm sorry, I'm excited to see.